Welcome to the UCD Institute of Food and Health uh, Research Bites. So it, it really is a special research bite. I think the first one where we have had the COVID uh, lockdown restrictions removed. So we'll look to see the format that we'll continue these in now that we have the opportunity to go back and do some of them in person as well. But this morning we will have it via Zoom and I'm delighted that Dr. Sharon O'Rourke who is going to present for us this morning. So Sharon is an Ad Astra Fellow and she's in the UCD School of Biosystems and Food Engineering. She has been appointed as an assistant professor and her research is focusing on soil carbon and its importance in agronomy and climate change mitigation. Her current work on soil carbon is funded by the Irish Research Council Starting Laureate Award and that's the project that she's going to share with us and talk to us about this morning. So Thank you very much for joining us this morning, Sharon, and over to you. Thank you. And thank you, um, Dolores and, and Geraldine. Thank you for the opportunity to talk um, at the Research Bite series. It's very nice um, to be included. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, I just put this on to uh, present your view here. And um, I shall start. So um, yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my current work, including um, so my main project, which is called Carbon Nutrient Stoichiometry to Stabilise Soil Organic Matter and Improve Soil Functions. So it's actually the, the same title, and um, the talk's the same title as the project. Okay, so um, as introduction, I thought it'd be good to outline some of the key challenges in the area of soils, or specifically soil carbon, which is the area I'm interested in. And in terms of how my work fits into the themes of the Institute of Food and Health. It's over here in primary production systems. So to make a link between soils and food, um, I put up this diagram, which is um, demonstrating how soil security links to food security and places soils as central to this other six um, global societal challenges of food security, water security, uh, climate change abatement, biodiversity protection, ecosystem services, and energy sustainability. So you could say that soils underpin all of these other global challenges. So just to mesh that a little bit further, um, soils link out to these other challenges um, through a range of services that they provide. Um, which we could describe as soft functions. So soft functions now have um, developed scientific concepts. So there's a, there's a list here, um, and I'll just read them out briefly. So biomass production, um, nutrient cycling, uh, soil biodiversity, uh, cultural environment, um, source of raw materials, carbon pool or carbon stock, um, and cultural heritage. So there are a range of um, soft functions and then they feed into the other um, societal challenges. So I'm interested in number six, which is uh, soil carbon. So that's kind of for two different objectives. One is for climate change mitigation, or we can now say climate change adaptation, that's also relevant. And the other is um, for sustainable soil management. So here lies the challenge um, within that area. So carbon or soil organic carbon is known as a keystone indicator of soil quality. So whereby soil carbon um, increases, so does soil quality or the, the overall functioning of the soil. So, so soil carbon then has a relationship with, with um, a range of other soil properties and, and soil properties are kind of bundled um, into each of the soil functions. So I'm looking specifically to quantify the relationship between soil carbon and a range of other soil properties. And, and maybe sometimes in the past, soil hasn't been given um, dual recognition, maybe as some of the other challenges because uh, the soil community have found it difficult to, to make these quantitative relationships um, in the past. Okay, so in terms of the policy context, now soil is getting that recognition and soil health and food is 
one of the five EU missions in Horizon Europe. So there's a lot of funding um, coming through for um, soil management, sustainable soil management um, in Horizon Europe 2021 to 27. And in terms of carbon, one of the things that have been um, happening in at EU level over the last uh, year or two is a series of carbon farming roundtable discussions. And these have been looking at result-based carbon farming. So how do we get farmers to, car to farm carbon in addition to their existing agricultural enterprise? Um, so one of the um, outputs of the EU carbon farming initiative is this technical guidance handbook. Um, so Europe are looking at the best way to roll out um, result-based carbon farming in Europe and that includes um, a review of all the agri-tech internationally to see how um, we could implement this in the best possible way in Europe. Okay, so the onto the research project I mentioned. So the, the title um, is I went through before, it's Carbon Nutrient Stoichiometry to Stabilize Soil Organic Matter and Improve Soil Function. Um, and what I'm looking at here is carbon stoichiometry, so carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur. And um, the link between uh, using this as a mechanism to increase stabilize soil carbon in soil, whereby those other nutrients are also locked down with carbon in soil and using it as a mechanism to push the system further. So to, to sequester a higher rate of soil carbon than just relying on um, net plant primary production or the amount of soil organic matter that's being returned to soil. So that means manipulating um, nutrients at a macro scale in order to increase the soil carbon stock overall. And as I mentioned just earlier in terms of the context, we don't really have a way to prescribe sustainable soil management in the field whereby an agronomist or an agricultural advisor can go out into a field and um, measure the soil, current soil carbon stock and um, evaluate the soil quality status of that field and then um, you know, prescribe a, a rate of soil carbon increase that's required to move the soil carbon status, soil quality status um, up to a desired level. So we, we don't know quite how to do that. So this is looking at carbon uh, stoichiometry as, an, as a mechanism by which to control carbon um, and while looking at the relationships between soil carbon and, and soil function. So the, the team um, working on this project so far are uh, three PhD students, is Nazish and Sharan, um, pictured here working on um, an initial experiment, and I'll, I'll come back to that. And also um, a third student, Cheyenne, who just started uh, this month. So hopefully it doesn't get too complicated because there's me, Sharon, and Sharan and Cheyenne, so um, poor Nazish in this scenario. Um, but just to mention, this, this project is a um, IRC starting Laria project, and then the acronym for the project is uh, Carbon Function. Okay, so the, the project runs over three phases. There is a laboratory incubation experiment, um, and then there's a, a glass house trial, and then finally um, the experiment moves out into the field. So we're looking at the small scale initially to test the carbon, um, nitrogen, and phosphorus, sulfur, stoichiometric ratio for fine fractions of organic matter stabilization. So we're looking at a specific fraction um, and we're testing the theory on a range of different soils with different texture and different initial soil carbon content. Um, and then this experiment is looking at the microbial processing. So it has a large microbial focus to look at um, what is the influence of balancing nutrients for carbon on the microbial community in terms of who's there and, and what they're doing. So that's the first part. And then this experiment scales up to the glass house 
And the aim is to look at nutrient management regimes to maximize the carbon and the pro crop productivity together. So we um, want to see if we look, if we're getting the same results in, in the soil carbon stabilization when the crop is introduced. So the crop will have its own nutrient um, requirements or nutrient demands. So they're taking nutrients from the system, but they're also adding carbon through the root system and turnover of the fine um, root material. Uh, so that, these two experiments are ongoing at the moment. And then the field experiment then moves to, a, to take this dual fertilization strategy. So that's nutrients for the, the straw um, that's added to this nutrients nutrient balancing of the fresh carbon input and then uh, nutrients for the crop as normal. So putting those two things together um, in the field and introducing another measure um, in arable systems, which is till versus no till. So what happens if um, we look at that when the soil is disturbed by the plough versus being left intact, um, which influences the structure and opportunities for the carbon to break down over time. Okay, so a couple of um, results from an initial experiment. So before we, we jumped into the, the soil incubation studies, that's the, the first work package, um, we looked at a carbon dioxide uh, carbon evolution study, initially to define the length of period for incubation cycle. Um, so we looked at this over 16 weeks, and um, so we've, we've settled on a 12-week incubation. And also just to get a, a feel for um, how the treatments affected the CO2. So it's kind of an, an initial trial um, to make sure that the investment of the large experiment um, is worthwhile. So this is um, five uh, figures with, um, well, demonstrating the CO2 over five individual soils. And this is the total CO2 respiration um, over the 12 week period. So we found that, oops, sorry, uh, we found that adding nutrients, just bring this down here, adding nutrients, um, so that's the N1 treatment. So balancing nutrients at 100%, so then adding nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur increased the rate of mineralization in some soils over the control, but not all soils. So this is across one incubation study. So we're hoping that, or we're assuming that over multiple incubation cycles that we'll see carbon sequestration or carbon mineralization happening across all soils. So that was, that was the first thing. Um, and then the second thing we were looking at was a couple of nutrient limiting treatments. So these are nitrogen limiting, phosphorus limiting, and sulfur limiting treatments. And usually in soil, maybe carbon nitrogen or carbon nitrogen phosphorus are examined. But sulfur is actually also a very important nutrient, but most of the time it's left out. So just to draw your attention to one soil here, those nutrient treatments didn't achieve the same rate of mineralization as the fully balanced uh, nutrient treatment. And we have a bit of a caveat in our experiment where we went out to sample five different um, farms in the Leinster area, and we found a very high phosphorus status, which we weren't expecting to find. And um, it's reported, you know, that farms are um, well, on a national scale, demonstrating a decline in phosphorus fertility over the last few years. So that was a bit of a surprise um, and maybe not so ideal for our experiment, but we're able to show through this experiment that um, even though that there is a high residual um, phosphorus fertility or, or background P, it still isn't enough to supply um, the, the microbes with phosphorus to achieve the same rate of mineralization when the nutrients are balanced by stoichiometric ratios. Okay, so, and then um, this is a, a two-way NOVA um, statistical table just showing there is um, 
a significant effect over time. So um, this is this, the seven time periods of the experiment. So the, the CO2 um, was captured and measured at weekly and then um, two weekly intervals. So there's a significance over time and then um, a significance of nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur and kind of the, the same level of significance as you would expect that nitrogen is the most important nutrient followed by phosphorus, but sulfur is also um, important in this scenario. Okay, so as part of um, that experiment, Sharan is looking to determine if the short-term change in soil carbon or other fractions, so that's the stabilized soil organic carbon or maybe an indicator species such as, or fractions such as particular organic matter, can be detected in a short period of time. So in the field, changes in soil stock are usually measured over a four year period. So we're looking at very small changes in short periods of time to be able to, to really kind of look very closely at the relationship between soil carbon and other soil properties at the micro scale. So um, here's some results from a principal component analysis um, and showing the, the first two principal components capturing um, most of the soil variability, but in the first plot here, we're not seeing a clear treatment effect um, across the five soils. And instead we're seeing um, very strong um, soil composition characteristics. So um, we're moving now to look at um, measuring and predicting uh, short-term changes in soil carbon. And, and Charan is um, working on that component of the study at the moment. Okay, sorry, just come to the next slide. Okay, so in terms of um, the other things we're looking at, I'm, I'm just gonna talk about work package one maybe because we haven't um, full set of results for the, the glasshouse trial and the field trial, but the incubation study is just entering into cycle number three. So that's the third cycle of 12 weeks. And on the final cycle, there's going to be um, a soil microbial investigation. And this will look at the microbial diversity and the microbial function in response to this provision of supplementary nutrients. And we're considering with the treatments of full um, balanced nutrients versus the nutrient limitation. Um, and then we want to quantitatively link the increases in soil carbon with soil functions. So we're looking at soil fertility and soil um, structure. So how those two things change specifically with increases in soil carbon. So um, Nazi should be looking at uh, metagenomics and metatranscriptonomics. And the work has been done over in Rosemount Peck environmental, um, environmentally controlled chambers, it's the walk-in chambers. Um, and then we'll be doing the microbial work in Dr. Evelyn Doyle's lab. So some of the literature in this area, looking at straw decomposition and, and nutrient supply has highlighted that sometimes there can be keystone indicate or keystone taxa um, that do very well when the nutrients are more balanced um, to the carbon input. So this is interesting because it means that the soil microbiome becomes very efficient at um, breaking down and converting fresh organic matter to stabilize carbon. But it raises questions then about the resilience of the soil microbial community. If it becomes a bit streamlined um, where the microbial diversity is reduced over time. Okay, and then to look at some of the other things that I'm working on, I have a recently funded Chagas Walsh Fellowship um, from 2021 and a new student, Long and she has started uh, just in the middle of autumn and working on a project called Predicting Soil Carbon Sequestration Potential of Irish Soils. So this work is um, using two data sets. So one is Terra Soil, which is part of the GSI, um, I've forgotten the name of it, 
it'll the, sorry the Telus survey. So Terrasol is part of the Telus project, and um, it's also using this Irish soil information system. So these two big soil libraries are being scanned with spectral um, measurements as so Vis NIOR and MIOR, and we're looking to see what is the potential for soil carbon sequestration. So hopefully this will highlight the the, the soils um, and the farming enterprises where, where the most potential lies um, for increasing carbon stock across the island of Ireland. And then in terms of um, nutrient management, this is where I, I started out in my PhD. Um, and I'm returning to look in this area again because I'm very conscious that if you're thinking about adding nutrients to the soil, to increase the rate of soil carbon sequestration as a mechanism to increase soil carbon stocks, you need to be thinking about nutrient loss pathways. So this is some um, older data I have of phosphorus um, loss through runoff following um, application of dairy slurry to grassland and using um, surfos, which is a, a surface runoff um, model to predict um, phosphorus losses over time. So it's uh, looking at a specific management strategy to delay the interval between surrey application and rainfall as a means to reduce um, peak concentrations over time and looking at the different fractions um, in slurry. And then bringing this model forward, um, I've started some work with a group in Cornell University, and it's actually um, another couple of, um, well, universities that are involved in this project, but headed up by um, Kirsten Reed in, in Cornell, where the, um, the same kind of runoff prediction models are included into a whole, whole farm system model. So this is of particular interest to me because it's tracking nitrogen and phosphorus at the farm scale, in addition to um, a carbon a carbon model, which is Roth-C, which predicts um, how organic matter to, um, input to soil is converted to carbon stock. So I'm interested in that, um, particularly through the carbon stoichiometric um, mechanism. So this looks at the animal components, so the feeding, um, of the animals, then the manure and the, the nutrient contents in the manure that's added to the soil, and um, the crop, the soil and crop components, so that's the nitrogen, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon cycling within um, the soil in different cropping systems, and also the storage. So the idea for, for this model is that it's really um, the whole systems model, but it's also to track. Um, animal feed and nutrient cycling at a farm gate level. And that's a next generation home farm, whole farm dairy sustainability analysis. So I'm going to be um, validating this model because I have um, data that connects um, three out of four of the components in the model. So this is an open source, open source software that's of open source software that's um, almost completed this project um, nearing the end. Um, okay, so that's it for me, a couple of references and um, my contact details. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to drop me a line um, later on.